actually from a DARPA project, DARPA funded project, uh, where we had money to work on education for the Defense Department schools. And we built a program called Crisis in Krasnovia, in which the job was, of the student was to figure out proper US foreign policy based on conditions of a fictional country called Krasnovia. In, was located at that moment in Central Europe. Uh, and we interviewed lots of experts around the country, including this particular man, um, about the general issues. This man was a, one of the ambassadors in the first George Bush administration. This clip is 15 to 16 years old. It occurred right after the first Gulf War. Saddam Hussein serves our interests in the Middle East right now. You don't have to like him. But Having him remain in power as of this moment is probably the best thing we could have. Let's guess, what happens if Saddam Hussein goes? Well, I've already said ambiguity is the key. You don't know what's going to happen if Saddam Hussein goes, but a good, logical, intelligent guess is going to tell you that it's going to be something bad. If Saddam Hussein goes uh, and upsteps Izat Ibrahim, you can use a sports analogy and it's now second and ten. Okay, so sorry Izat, you got to go too. Okay, here comes then Taha Yassin Ramadan. So now it's third and ten. So what do you do? You apply the well-known international principle of kill for peace and you take off the top 294 people. What's going to happen now? The Shia, the Sunni, the Barzanis and the Talibanis, the two big groups of the Kurds and the Chaldeans, and the Yazidis, and the Sabaeans, and all the other cults and sects are going to rush out into the streets of Baghdad to settle their long-standing differences, and they're not going to use ballots that they've been saving up to do that. Can you spell Bosnia? Have you ever heard of Lebanon? It would be a bloodbath, I think. Okay, two key points here. The first, prediction is a pretty important skill. We learn how to do it as babies predict that you one foot in front of the other will get you places, predict that screaming will get you milk, and we get smarter as over time. The second is the obvious point I'm making, which is this is U.S. corporate memory, folks. I've had this clip in my, my library for 16 years. Uh, we couldn't have a way to do and didn't have a way to do what I'm demanding we have to be able to do, which is make the wisdom of the people available, uh, the smartest people in the country available to the people who make decisions, or to everybody. I don't care who. But you got to collect it first. I have lots of stories in this guy. They're a riot. Another ambassador of the George Bush administration from the same time told the same time. What modeling is, is we all have models of the world. Our models of the world get better over time. They screw up. The other day I was in, found myself in Paris. With, I used to live in Paris with a model of the world that you can get in the middle of the morning through Paris in 15 minutes and discovered, hey, they haven't built any new highways in the last 20 years. So my model wasn't too good. Um, we are updating our models all the time. Here's a, an example. Of Kissinger was having a staff meeting and somebody was briefing him on something. And the briefer got up and pulled out his pointer, and the first thing he said was, Our enemy, the Soviet Union, and Kissinger interrupted and said, Young man, the Soviet Union is merely our adversary. The enemy is the CIA. <laughs> Okay, now I, again, this is a similar kind of story, but I like it because it talks about a model of the world, which is not particularly wildly important today, or maybe it is. I mean, maybe one has to understand the tension between the State Department and the, and the intelligence services. But this is all part of education in a deep sense of education, not school, but having available knowledge come to you when you need it. Experimentation uh, is a thing that everybody does. I, in my education talks, I have a picture of my grandson playing with a hose, which is experimentation in its early form. Um, of course, this chemist that I interviewed was doing experimentation too, and I just thought I'd let you see a little bit of what he's thinking about. In trying to solve a dishwashing problem, we took the soil, which is usually our biggest enemy, and turned it into our friend. We took the grease in the soil and the water, which is added in dishwashing, and combined it with our product to produce something which performed a lot better. Now, one of the things you know, I want you to note is there's a proverb in there. Make your enemy your friend. It's a very well-known proverb. Um, and indexing is like, just like that. Proverbs are a very, very important part of indexing for reasons I'll explain in a minute. And so he's talking about something, but if he puts it in those proverbial terms, it's a lot easier to remember the generic point later on when you have a similar problem. Typically, the problem with microemotions is that the minute you apply them uh, to a situation, they are starting to lose their effectiveness as they are diluted from the minute they enter the wash or the dishwashing process. Um, the 
the brilliance of this idea was that rather than have them start to lose their effectiveness from time equals zero, we added what was effectively a proto micro emulsion, the precursor to a. Anyway, there's details on the experiments, but what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get across is this that the experiments that people have performed should not be performed twice. Okay, yet again, we don't have access to results of experiments done by everybody, but we should. Evaluation is something we do constantly. We have a set of values. We try to figure what's important and what's not important. We also evaluate, and this is very important for this point, for this conference, we also evaluate the ideas of others. And this is a double one of those. And this is my favorite thing. I show them all the time is Sarah, Sarah Palin supporters. She is the ep epitome of conservativeness. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, if the Republican Party doesn't back her, it doesn't matter because she's going to get the presidency. How about, how about foreign policy? What would you like to see her do in terms of foreign policy? To be honest with you, I don't know anything about her foreign policy. The state that, that, that she did govern yeah. was right across the street from Russia. Right. Uh, right. You could you know, cross so the street could, and you'd be in another country. Yeah, and I'm not saying that she's ever had to deal with Russia, right. but... I'm sure she's had, you know, boundary issues sure. that she had to deal with. Yeah. Like, we got boundary issues in Mexico right now. What are some of the uh, problems that you have with... Okay. So, one of the things that we do, and it's an important part of understanding and understanding that everybody does it, is we evaluate everyone else's intelligence when they talk. And so, everyone in the room is now thinking, well, this guy's a dope. I mean, if you like Sarah Palin, this guy's a dope. So... Why is that important? It's important because if you want to negotiate across cultures, you don't want to seem to be a dope because they're evaluating whether or not you're a dope at every moment. Okay, diagnosis. And that one's in red because as it turns out, there are three of these. I'm not showing you show you every one of them because I don't have that kind of time. Diagnosis is one of the big three. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. So we notice when people misdiagnose. <laughs> planning, I put a picture of myself in there because uh, I just recently executed what is the stupidest plan I'd ever thought of in my life. That's a picture of me at a dacha in Siberia uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, and the reason it was a stupid plan is that I then had to fly from there to Bogota, Colombia, and then back to Europe again all on the same trip. And, and I told this to people, everybody's, what, are you crazy? Why would you plan it that way? And I'm thinking, yeah, why would I plan it that way? It was really stupid. Again, planning is one of the big three. Teamwork. Teamwork is an enormously important problem. It's not a sign of intelligence. There are plenty of smart people who can't work in teams, but nevertheless, it matters a lot. You don't have to explain the value of teamwork to military folks, but it is important, and it is one of the cognitive processes that, that make a big difference. Um, and this is a con negotiation happens to be one of my one of my um, twelve processes, and it also happens to be something I've worked on. So this is Roger Fisher, who I actually think is dead at this point, but uh, which even makes my point even better. Uh, Roger Fisher wrote a book called Getting to Yes, and he was one of the he was a guru of negotiation. People should go to negotiation seminars at Harvard run by him. And I built courses on negotiation with him as the expert. So I have a lot of Roger Fisher negotiation stories, which is again part of my point of the collecting of these stories is important. A friend of mine was trying to buy a radio station, and I said, Tom, can I help you? You've been very helpful to us in some ways. He said, this guy's greedy. He wants too much money. I said, why does he want money? He said, I don't know. He's supposed to be greedy. I said, tell me what he does. What will he use the money for? He said, I've got no idea. He comes to the radio station every morning, gets there about 6 o'clock in the morning, works till 8 o'clock at night. That's his only life. He wants too much money for the radio station. I said, I don't think it's money he wants. I think he wants to manage the radio station. From what you tell me, he's built this station up over several years to being the best one in the market. 
why don't you offer him a way to continue to own a piece of the radio station and a five-year contract to manage it? Then maybe it'll cost you less money. The interests were quite compatible. The buyer wanted a good manager for the radio station. The manager wanted to have some equity in it. And once his interests were fully understood, they worked out a deal with great saving to my friend. Now, people are, in fact, born knowing how to negotiate. And you think, I say opposite, but it's not true. Babies negotiate all the time. Um, I was just visiting my two-year-old grandson who was here, uh, and he is constantly negotiating, usually losing, but he's negotiating. Uh, so the issue of, uh, of negotiation is understood, but that doesn't make you expert. And if we're going to start talking about teaching people how to negotiate across cultures, I would like them to actually learn something about negotiation at, at an expert level, which means there should be people talking about lot, telling lots of negotiation stories, because that's what's memorable, not you should always bid lower I mean, or some nonsense like that. Here's another one of his stories. Another case I remember in the labor negotiation, the union leader was demanding these very hard terms. He demanded this and this and this and this. I met him privately away from the company, talked with him a bit. My judgment was his real interest was in getting reelected as a union president by looking tough. I said to him, suppose you look tough. Here's a draft settlement terms. Suppose you called a press conference and you demanded that the president of the company come and sign your terms just the way they are, without changing a word. And I said, suppose you knew the president would do that. Well, he was smiling at this. And I said, if these are your terms, the president will sign them. So he got the credit for looking tough and making it his proposal. It was named after him, the labor leader's proposal, drafted in the company office. <laughs> it's not a rele an irrelevant point negotiating across cultures. Okay, describing another big one, red one. Uh, again, I'm just going to tell you one of my stories, and that's a picture of the Stanford AI lab circa 1970-something. Uh, I was a professor there for about five years. Uh, and I learned a lot of lessons at Stanford, because it was mentioned, I, I don't usually say this, that I was a professor at 22. Which, which, the translation of that is I knew nothing. Okay. <laughs> and um, I w was, there was a Stanford course in AI, which every professor in AI got up and gave a week of in the first semester of graduate school in those days. And then at the end of that semester or quarter, they would pick someone to work with in the second semester. And I was working with a guy named Ken Colby, uh, who had hired me there as a famous psychiatrist who did psychiatry and AI kind of things. And he was very nice to me and said, OK, well, you'll work with me, and I'll, I'll give you one of my slots, and you talk. And that happened, and we each had, we shared the week. And then next quarter, students chose. And I know that in general, they, each professor got one or two students. We got 25. Oh, man, I'm the coolest, greatest professor in the whole world. Man, I'm so great. And we went around in the room to ask them why they'd come. Every single one had come to work with him. <laughs> and I said, what did I do wrong? And he said, he said, you had an hour to talk, and in that hour, you tried to say everything you know. He said, if everything you know fits in an hour, you don't know much. <laughs> He'd just been funny and amusing and light, and I thought, oh, he's light, he's like, funny, he's not, yeah, except he knew something I didn't know. And I learned from him a lot, as it turns out, because it's good to have senior mentors. I'd like to have them in video for everybody, but that's how it really works, is you got one, you're lucky, you got one with me. And so I learned a lot about that. All right, now I was telling you about the big three, and this is what I want to tell you, which is that ultimately we judge other people's intelligence constantly in terms of the big three. And my very favorite example of the stupidest thing I've ever seen on television, which you probably have seen too, but it always bears repeating, fails on three levels here. It fails on diagnosis of what the question was, on planning what the answer should be, on being able to talk in any way, shape, or form.